Good morning, everybody. Thank you for all coming, uh, 8 o'clock, you know, thank you. Uh, and um, just want to go ahead and respect people's time with the presentation here. Uh, the title is Alternative of Traditional Informed Consent. Just to introduce, uh, Dr. Philbin is a research director at Mass General uh, uh, Hospital. Uh, Dr. Goldstein is the vice chair for faculty affair. Myself, I'm an investigator at the Brigham Women's Hospital. Disclosures as above, uh, respectively, each of us. Traditional informed consent, just briefly, there's eight items, just, you know, a lot of uh, you already aware, uh, but just briefly is uh, just describing the purpose to the patient, you know, the really his SOP of the uh, protocol, the risk, the benefits, uh, potential alternate procedures as well, if any, uh, you have to disclose that. Confidentiality, of course, uh, kind of a, a straightforward. Uh, compensation, if any, as well. And if injury occurs, that's also very important to have that language in there. Uh, whom to contact. And of course, lastly, voluntary, okay? And refusal to participate doesn't affect your clinical care. I want to kind of introduce just two uh, topics, uh, non-traditional informed consent, alteration of informed consent, exception from informed consent. So I'll go ahead with uh, Dr. Philbin to start with that. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, so I'm gonna cover the alteration of informed consent and give you an example of how we applied this um, <coughs> to, a, uh, to, a, to a study. Um, so uh, the alteration of informed consent is actually uh, tied together with a waiver of informed consent. And this has actually been part of the Code of Federal, uh, federal Regulation, or the Common Rule, uh, really since 1991. So this has always uh, kind of existed in the regulations, but it's probably not really implemented uh, very frequently. So just covering it, um, <clears throat> so it's a, a general waiver or alteration of consent. Uh, and it's really up to the IRB. So the IRB can choose um, to uh, approve uh, the waiver or alteration or not, uh, depending on their comfort with the particular project. And it needs to meet four different criteria. So number one, the research uh, involves no more than minimal risk. And just to let you know, so pretty much all the retrospective kind of chart review uh, research that we do actually falls under the waiver of informed consent. And we're talking about this today really in uh, in the context of uh, human tissues or blood samples, uh, essentially. Uh, so number one, uh, the research has to involve no more than minimal risk. And when that comes to blood draw, that's a certain you know, volume of blood. Um, and number two, uh, the research cannot practically, uh, practically be carried out without the requested waiver or alteration. And number three, the waiver um, or alteration will not adversely affect the rights or welfare of the subject. And rights really, uh, in this context, is uh, privacy for the most part. And welfare, uh, you know, do uh, the patient no harm? Um, you know, we're not taking a lot of blood uh, or tissue uh, from these patients or their discarded samples. And number four, whenever appropriate, um, <clears throat> provide um, the subject or their LAR uh, with uh, additional information after their participation. And for retrospective chart reviews, we don't do this because it's not practical. Um, so. so an example of implementing an alteration of informed consent um, at our hospital, uh, MGH, and we actually extended it to the Brigham Women's Hospital and Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in the setting of an industry-sponsored study looking at a rapid pathogen diagnostic uh, technology, essentially getting a sample of whole blood, um, isolating uh, a pathogen if present, and then doing whole genome sequencing of that pathogen, all within the matter of hours. So hopefully this technology will take the place of blood cultures at some point. At the beginning of the study, our goal was to enroll 300 patients and as you can imagine, in this particular study and validating this technology, you really need to get the sample concurrent with the clinical blood culture, so the, the gold standard. So we did the study for a number of months, as I'll 
demonstrate to you uh, with traditional informed consent. And then we switched over to an alteration of informed consent after 18 months. And you'll, it'll become obvious when I show you the data why we did that. So the study itself um, involved obtaining 16 mils of blood, like I say, concurrent with the clinical culture in patients that are at risk for bacteremia and receiving clinical blood cultures. Uh, and as part of the alteration, we obtained uh, informed consent from the patient or their LAR within 24 hours of obtaining the sample. So we collected the samples uh, with the initial um, blood draw when the patient arrived into the bay in the emergency department, and we did not get their consent until after we collected the sample. So I have two data slides that kind of uh, demonstrate the effectiveness or the efficiency of of the uh, implementing the alteration, um, which on a, <clears throat> the uh, time on the horizontal here by month, and the vertical dotted line over at the end there uh, is uh, demarcates when we um, implemented the alteration. So in the 18 months of traditional informed consent, we were able to enroll 90, uh, 96 patients. The consent rate, as you'll see there at the bottom, is 53%. So essentially, we had to approach about 200 patients to enroll those 96 patients. Uh, and despite that, um, in 11 of those patients, we actually weren't able to get the blood. And this is a couple hours down the line after the patient had arrived. And a lot of these, uh, a lot of the samples were obtained by a separate stick. So that equated to about you know, five enrollments or less per month. When we implemented the alteration uh, in the five months to the right, uh, as you can see, our enrollment rates per month kind of skyrocketed, you know, five times the number of enrollments, what, 125 enrollments, and the consent rate uh, was 94%, and we weren't quite sure what to expect. Um, certainly less than, you know, 94% was the expectation, maybe 75%, but the vast majority of patients were perfectly fine uh, consenting to have their, their blood that was already drawn, used for research. So this demonstrates the uh, uh, time to obtaining the sample in the 18 months prior. Um, we were obtaining samples at an average of greater than two hours after ED arrival. And importantly, the, uh, the proportion of samples that were concurrent with uh, the clinical blood culture draw was 37%. Um, compared to over on the right side, alteration of informed consent, we're getting samples within a half an hour of arrival, and 100% concurrence with the clinical blood culture. And if you go back to these numbers, 96 minus 11, we couldn't get, so that's 85. 37% of 85 is about 30 patients in the 18 months prior compared to 125 patients in the five months post. That's like a, essentially like a 16-fold factor increase in efficiency uh, for enrollment. Okay, so what are the benefits of the alteration? Uh, it really enable enrollment rates uh, that are needed to efficiently uh, develop and test uh, this new diagnostic, and one that could be uh, you know, of you know, much significance in the clinical realm, so very important. Um, it enabled research sample to be obtained uh, at a relevant time point for the development of a diagnostic, and typically we do these studies and obtain consent um, like I, I said, prospectively, and we get the sample two, three, four hours down the road, the patient's already been resuscitated. Um, and in my area of research in sepsis, they've received antibiotics, fluids, resuscitation, and you know, is that time point four hours uh, after triage really representative of a diagnostic we'll be using um, for these patients uh, in the future at triage? Uh, it obviates the need for a fresh stick uh, for a research sample. And, Patients really appreciated this. Uh, we didn't really uh, formally um, query the patients. Um, we'll probably do this in the future, uh, but just kind of anecdotally, the patients are like, yeah, go ahead, use my blood. Uh, I'm really happy that we don't have to get a separate stick for research. And it allowed us to actually recruit sicker patients. So in the post-alteration um, cohort, the patients were sicker. They had higher rates of blood culture positivity, vasopressor initiation, ICU uh, admission. And also, uh, we enrolled a more diverse population. There was twice as many uh, non-white patients in the post cohort. So with that, I will hand it over to Josh.
Great. Thank you, uh, thank you, Dr. Philbin. Actually, I'll talk into here. Ooh. Great, so now I'll talk about exception from informed consent. In 1996, federal regulations were released allowing for exception from informed consent in emergency research. And this is, this is a, a situation where you enroll people and treat them um, uh, with, uh, prior to or, or without informed consent. <clears throat> it's, it's under Title 21, Code of Federal Regulations, Section 50.24, so it's abbreviated 21 CFR 50.24. And the goals of this were, were to permit the study of life-threatening conditions where current treatment is unproven or unsatisfactory. You can imagine this unproven or unsatisfactory as a key piece. Uh, you can't do this if, if you have a condition for which there's a known treatment that is good, right? We have to pick, we have to pick conditions that current treatments aren't good enough. Uh, we have to provide individuals in life-threatening situations access to potentially life-saving therapies, uh, advanced knowledge through collection of information about effectiveness and safety. Uh, and that, that, that bullet point was really intended to highlight that there are many, that without this kind of work, there are many times, especially in the emergency department, that we give people treatments that are not FDA approved, right? This happens all the time. And we often do treatments for which there's not a phase three randomized control trial showing that there's a benefit of this treatment. And the FDA wanted to highlight that there's this huge opportunity for us to study whether the things people are already doing are any good or are bad, or whether we're killing people and don't know it and whether we'll never find that out if we can't do, do a study. And, and so I, I really like this highlight of, of, we want to know if the things that people are doing or could do are effective or safe. And last, improve therapies used in emergency medical conditions that currently have poor clinical outcomes. So what kind of research can qualify for this kind of work? You have to have all of the following conditions. There's more, but I've tried to summarize it. It has to be a life-threatening situation that necessitates urgent intervention. Available treatments have to be unproven or unsatisfactory. Obtaining informed consent is not feasible. Um, and so this would be, it, it, you, the argument can't be uh, it's, it's too, um, uh, that, that it's really difficult or I can't get a coordinator. You have to show that there's, this, that there's a circumstance where there's no meaningful way to get informed consent. The intervention must be administered before consent can be obtained from a legally authorized representative. This is a piece of time in there. So the ideal uh, therapy for EFIC is if whatever treatment you're studying, the benefit of it should be time dependent. It should be that giving you the same treatment two hours later is, is worse, right? And that, there, and that uh, uh, if we do inform consent, we're gonna lose the opportunity to evaluate effectiveness and safety. There must be no reasonable way to prospectively identify individuals likely to become eligible for participation. This is a common one that comes up when we talk to people about it, which is, can't you pre-consent people, right? In case you have a cardiac arrest, you'd like to be in this study, right? And people would wear a bracelet that says, you know, boy, if I should ever be in a car accident, go ahead and roll me in your transfusion study. Be that Many people have looked into this and tried this, and it's absolutely not feasible, I promise you. If anybody wants to ask, please do, uh, but it's basically impossible. Uh, and participation in the research holds out the prospect of direct benefit to subjects. Another key one that I want to highlight uh, there, which is, for example, this blood draw study that we're hearing about, the patient themselves may not directly benefit from that lab draw study. So it's a hard sell. You, you have to argue that that you're doing an intervention the patient themselves may benefit from. So the ideal uh, EFIC study is one of a, a treatment that we have reason to believe will help them. And then the last, of course, the clinical investigation cannot be practically uh, carried out otherwise. You have to do community consultation. Prior to the beginning of the study, you notify the community and provide opportunities for discussion and feedback. This is not community consent. They don't have to agree to it. You just have to get their opinions and bring it to the IRB. Public disclosure, notify the community the study will occur and provide a way for people to opt out of the study with a bracelet or be on a list. There should be ongoing notification the study is happening and then notification that it occurred after the study is done and, that, and you need ongoing oversight during the study. I'm gonna highlight a couple of studies using exception from consent. The public access to defibrillation trial. This was a um, multi-center clinical trial in which units, shopping malls, and apartment complexes were randomly assigned to 
volunteers trained in CPR alone versus volunteers trained in CPR plus the use of AEDs. There are AEDs throughout this hotel. Um, those of you who are watching virtually may not know it, but I will tell you, this hotel has a lot of AEDs. I'm at, heading to the airport after that, and the airport has a bunch of AEDs. And it's because somebody did a trial of, of exception from informed consent of we should put AEDs in buildings and teach people to use them. Um, and so, uh, and of course, that study couldn't have been done with, ex with uh, traditional consent. Rapid anticonvulsant medications prior to arrival trial. This is a randomized trial for status epilepticus. Again, you can argue, uh, and did argue, that, um, that uh, status epilepticus, you can't practically do informed consent. Boost 3 is an ongoing phase 3 trial of multimodal monitoring for traumatic brain injury. Uh, so, so I will stop there, and uh, we can move to our panel for any questions. Since it's a small group, maybe we'll just kind of come down and we'll just kind of get in a circle. Is that okay? I would love that, except I'm supposed to stand by the microphone, or I could use your microphone. Oh, yeah, we have, have microphone, yeah. Right. We have microphone, yeah. Let's just kind of come around and kind of in a circle so that we can all kind of discuss. Since it's a small group, I think it might be better for. Is that okay, everybody? Yeah, come on in here. Anybody has any question for the speakers here? I was just curious for that altered consent. Um, do, do you have any pushback from your IRB? Like, because it sort of sounds like your argument is: is it better for us to get our project done, or better for the, you know, the patients? And I feel like our IRB is always going to side on the side of the patients and like push us to accommodate that versus what really makes sense to get our studies done in emergency medicine. <laughs> so I just wondered if you had any feedback for, for the, that. For the exception one or for, I think you were asking about his study. The alteration yeah. one. The alteration yeah. one, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean, our IRB, I think we initially had applied for just an outright waiver of informed consent. And the IRB was, you know, a little bit uncomfortable, especially since it was industry sponsored and we we're doing, you know, DNA sequencing yet on the pathogen, not actually on the patient themselves, and they're like, well, you know, uh, let's meet in the middle here on, on this alteration of informed consent. And it's really a, que and it's a question for the IRB, and, you, and yeah, we had to go to them and, you know, kind of negotiate with them, but it's in the regulations. You can argue that it's good for the, you know, the betterment of humankind to have, you know, a rapid pathogen detection device and gives you, you know, a pathogen within six hours as opposed to one to two days. So you just have to make that argument. It's going to be really uh, study dependent. I want to add, I, I feel like you showed me convincingly that, that patients liked your system better than the traditional system. They consented more. You made it easier for the patient. You made it more convenient for the patient, right? And that's maybe more ethical. Yeah, so that, that was going to be my question. So I wanted to ask, what, what do you attribute the change in recruitment success uh, to be from? Was it, um, did you have low consent rates because you couldn't get research personnel at the bedside at the time the first lab drawings were done and therefore, you know, it was too late to enroll the, the patient in the subject? Or were patients more likely to consent with the deferred consent process? And if that is the case, does that, you know, suggest some sort of ethical consideration where you know, the patient's autonomy may be lost, um, and maybe since the tube of blood was already drawn, they're more likely to agree to participate. Right, uh, so, yeah, so part of it was a pra practicality issue of just getting to the patient's bedside on time, um, and that's part of you know, the, the criteria for, for the alteration. Um, yeah, loss of, loss of autonomy, patient autonomy, that's a, that's a really interesting question, and that kind of falls under the, uh, the rights part of the, uh, the requirement for the waiver or alteration, and that's the ethical question, I guess, right? Um, so is it a risk to their privacy? Not, not really, because it's just like doing a retrospective study, you know, equivalent. Um, is it loss of autonomy? And, um, hmm. I don't know. I guess this group can, can you know, everybody has an opinion on that. <laughs> yeah, is it a loss of autonomy? Yeah, so, yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yep. Right. Yeah. I mean, I think that's where the minimal risk part of this comes into it. And, you know, the, the federal regulations have kind of defined this, you know, minimal risk criteria as in, hey, we as a society need to do studies on this kind of data that uh, exists or on a, you know, a few cc's of blood, extra blood that could be obtained for the purpose of research. So, uh, you know, the government's kind of come down pretty strongly on, hey, this is ethical. Yeah, and I think, you know, to be specific on your question on autonomy, autonomy is really about having informed consent. It doesn't define when you do it. So the participants still have the right to say no, which some did. So that's really the key thing. Autonomy is really they have the right ultimately to say, I want to participate or not participate. So I think that would be very specific, yeah. Yes. Right. Yes. Correct. So that's a very specific, separate issue on minimal risk. Yep. And it's also, if I could just say one more thing, it's also um, uh, the regulations kind of specify that um, you know this minimal risk is something that would not otherwise you know be way above and beyond usual clinical practice. So getting an extra tube, extra two tubes of blood is not um, deemed unreasonable. Uh, Blair Perry, Mass General. Um, so I, I um, helped Dr. Philbin uh, write this IRB and uh, it was certainly challenging and um, you know, I think the key here, what Dr. Feldman was just saying, is that it's not above what we're doing clinically for patients. So we're drawing blood on patients when they come into the emergency department. We're doing, we're using the same staff who are obtaining those samples. They're fully trained, aseptic technique, etc. So while the risk is low, I agree with you. They don't have the option to say yes or no. But as we all know, when when you're caring for for patients in the emergency department, the nurses pull off like. 10, 15 tubes, and they just sit there in the little bucket, right? And so, and, and to, to Peter's point, they do have the autonomy to say yes or no, because we stop processing the sample. So like the sample gets passed off, it in this case gets passed off to day zero uh, diagnostics, but then um, they, do not, they do not move forward with the processing, so. Sorry, Mike Daly from Albany. I think part of what you just said is part of is the reason that IRBs are so concerned with emergency medicine, right? Well, they take 10 or 15 tubes of blood. What's one more or less? It's still a patient's blood. It's still their choice on whether or not that blood gets used for something. And it would have been nine or 14 tubes of blood without participation in the study. Um, to us, that's nothing, right? To the IRB, that is an incredible violation. We have to be really careful on how we make that public to them. Oh, absolutely, yeah. There's actually amount of blood in, in the criteria, right. too, in minimal risk or not minimal risk. I'm going to just respect the next uh, session's time. Let's uh, maybe bring it out to the uh, uh, hallway, and we can discuss more. Thank you.